me now to discuss the series, The Valor and the Horror, as well as some of the issues that it raises, are two of Canada's most prominent military historians. Jack Granenstein served in the Canadian Army during the 50s and 60s and has taught history at York University in Toronto for more than 30 years. He is now the Roll Jackman Resident Fellow at the Canadian Institute of International Affairs. Brian Villa has been teaching history at the University of Ottawa for the past 35 years. He has received five major awards for his research and has worked on a number of historical television productions, but not, it should be said, The Valor and the Horror. Gentlemen, welcome and thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you. Um, as you can imagine, the series has generated just uh, an extraordinary uh, amount of, of, of mail and, and responses, and I thought maybe I'd start off by reading just a couple. We got uh, a lot of comments, as you can imagine, from veterans groups. Uh, one, for example, that says, you have defamed every loyal soldier and the memories of ones who lost their lives. Uh, but from some other veterans, from non-vets, and from uh, a lot of young people, we got uh, emails, and I'll just read you a couple of examples of those. As a young person who has had the privilege of serving in our peacetime armed forces, I personally found the valor and horror a glowing tribute to the brave soldiers who fought and in many cases died for this great country. And. My grandfather served in World War II and served in Sicily and Italy. When I hear that this show is controversial, I ask myself, what is meant by that? And I guess probably the first question is, what is meant by it? What is it about this series that generates such divergence of reactions? I don't think there's any doubt that it shows the bravery of the ordinary soldiers uh, and, and airmen. It does a very good job, it seems to me, of stressing uh, how ordinary Canadians rose to the challenge of, of the Second World War in combat. What is wrong with it, and what I think causes the controversy in a very real way, is that it paints these ordinary Canadians, however brave they are, as dupes, being uh, malused by generals, by politicians, who threw away their lives. And it's that which I think grossly unfair and grossly uh, unfounded. It's that that I think has created most of the controversy. Well, I certainly agree with Jack's first part, but I think before we get to the, to the question of unfairness, I think really the greatest problem with this is the technique that was used to make the point. The main thrusts of these uh, three installments is really very defensible. There's a lot of good historical evidence for the main thrust. It's the way they try to make the point, and it's really that that decision to use dramatic sequences with actors. And that really has caused them an enormous amount of the problem. One of the things that these actors do is uh, they are uh, so engaging, but they come on and you, the viewer has no escape from them. You, you, you are presented with, with these actors, young, clean, well-scrubbed, emoting all over the screen. And they do not give the viewer the least chance to do anything but to emote back the way they're supposed to. So that's why you feel that it had the, the kind of impact uh, with many the, the young viewers? The listener is made a prisoner when it's a historical debate that you want to hear the pluses and minuses. You don't hear the pluses and the minuses. You're forced by this dramatization to take this view or to reject it. And some people will take it and some will reject it. I think Brian's right on that. I think he's exactly right. Uh, the da I, I didn't have any problem telling what it was dramatization and what wasn't. I think that yeah. was perfectly clear. But it's very important when you're using dramatization that you don't have an actor give a little sneer or uh, hold his head in a certain way to convey an impression or come across as, as ruthless and hard. And there are many examples in this where they, I think, deliberately took what could have been relatively neutral words and presented them in a way that was designed to convey an impression. And that's the danger of dramatization. But certainly in this last one, uh, the controversial figure yes. is Harris. Uh, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering what kind of a man he was. Certainly he's not painted as uh, 
He's painted as a monster in the film, and there's no doubt that Harris was not a lovable character. He was a tough, hard man who was doing a nasty, brutal job and who was absolutely single-minded. I don't think there's any doubt of that in, in historians' accounts. Um, I, what I think is forgotten is that this is a man who was following the orders that he was handed. Um, he wasn't setting policy. He was doing what he was told, fundamentally. But was he doing... Uh well, if I might disagree a little bit with that, you know, if you really look at Harris in 42, he's pushing Churchill and the Chiefs of Staff so damn hard. He is falling orders in 43, 44, and 45, but that's because in 42, this man was a very aggressively pushing with the Millennium Raid program, which he began in 42. He really pushed awfully hard. Look, the, the main directive that Harris was following yeah. was issued before he took over as commander of Bomber Command. Yeah. And that seems to me to be fundamental. Yeah, this was a man who yeah, came into a job yeah. where the orders had been basically laid down. There's no doubt that he pushed once he got in. But those are the commanders that are successful, the ones who are pushers, the ones who have a single-minded devotion. And I don't think there's any, any doubt that that's what Harris was. But you know the worst evidence against Harris? It's what Harris wrote. I mean, you really read Harris and what he has said about the bomber program and how he justifies it. And it really comes across as a very insensitive, very hard, and, and uh, you know, no touch of human doubts of, of what is humane warfare or what isn't it. Just very hard and driving. What he himself said. But it's given, his memoirs that did him a lot of damage. Given what the, the, the orders were yeah. in terms yeah. of, there's no question, I imagine, bomb the cities, bomb the civilians. Setting aside the ethical issue for the, for the moment, how effective was that whole? Uh... I think it was, in fact, enormously effective. The Germans had to keep something like 900,000 soldiers manning uh, anti-aircraft artillery, manning searchlights uh, on the ground. They had to devote a vast percentage of their 88 millimeter guns, their best uh, anti-tank weapon as well as an anti-aircraft gun, to the defense of the Reich. They had to divert vast thousands of uh, tons of uh, scarce metals for the production of shells, for example. I've seen a figure presented by the, uh, one of the German, leading German military historians that 40,000 aircraft could have been built with the fuses, the aluminum fuses in the anti-aircraft shells. Um, I think it had an absolutely catastrophic diversion of resources from the German military, not to say anything at all about the destruction of German industry. Are your views, though, uh, is that it? Do most historians agree, or is there some uh, there, doubt? There has, been, there has been a lot of debate, starting from the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, which took place in, almost immediately after the war, uh, when people looked at German war production and saw that, in fact, it increased rather than decreased despite the bombing. And so the, the quick conclusion was that, therefore, the bombing had failed. What I think that... that judgment, and it was made by John Kenneth Galbraith, exactly. what that judgment failed to take into account was the diversion of resources uh, that took place to man the defenses, and the fact that German war industry had to be dispersed dramatically. And then the, the bombing campaign, which was also hitting transportation, uh, made it impossible to move stuff from one part of Germany to the front lines. So I think that uh, the original strategic bombing survey probably missed the point. But what about civilian morale, which it was supposed to have an impact? Uh... What we do know is that, uh, as in Britain, morale stayed probably remarkably high, all things considered. But there can be no doubt that the simple effect of having your home bomb, your family uh, in constant danger, has to have a significant effect on how people are facing the war. And certainly there were complaints. Uh, Germany was a police state. You couldn't complain very loudly. But there were complaints about uh, where's, uh, where's the Fuhrer now? It was Goring who, who said that uh, if there's any bombs on Berlin, you can call me Meyer. I suspect a lot of people were running around <laughs> calling him Meyer. <laughs> Here I'd like to disagree a little bit in this sense that um, I think the main thrust of the program on, on Death by Moonlight has an awful lot to be said for it. I really would stick up for it in this sense. Uh, there's a very grave moral question here about this program of bombing. Now, I would say to you that if your objective is, I, I can go along with terrorizing the civilian population, which is what was intended, 
provided you also have a policy that is going to bring something out of that, which is to say, you terrorize the civilian population to the point that people want to end the war, and, and you want to get a surrender, and you want to end the war. And if that was your objective, it was fine. The problem was that you had this terrible terror bombing to break the will, but you had no program for how to, what to do when you broke their will. In fact, what you had was unconditional surrender, you had people going around like Nguyen Leiser saying that you ought to uh, castrate or you ought to, you ought to reduce the German population by 10%. Uh, you had people saying that all the German soldiers should be sent off to Russia after the war to do labor. You had all of these terrible threats from people who weren't the government. And the, what was the government saying? The government saying we will not define what unconditional surrender means. We will do anything we feel is right and just. So what view did the German population that was being bombed to death say? They said to themselves, my God, if we do surrender, it's probably worse. And w how did they get such a dark view of allied leaders? Well, when these bombs were coming down, hitting mostly civilian population, hitting mostly women and children, because that's a fact. Most of the men were out of the cities, or a greater percentage. You can look at, these, at the demography of these cities. There are more women and children than there are men in them. But why was this? And if you were doing this, yeah. what confidence did the German people have? Now, we said, the Allied leaders, in fact, said, we don't want to have anything to do with the resistance leaders. We had nothing to do with them. We didn't want to encourage the resistance leaders to do anything. We didn't encourage them to surrender early. Brian, this is all very interesting, but it has nothing to do with the film. But it None of does. this was presented well, in the film. Well, and it, you're right. If it had been, it might have made some sense. But, of course, it wasn't. Because this was a film that aimed to slam our leadership, our military leadership, rather than to try to paint a full and complete picture. But I, it I, did I think talk about the, and was criticized for how much it talked about, the, the slaughter, the women and children, the incendiary bombs. I mean, it... This debate, in terms of whether it was right or wrong, is, uh, you're, you know better than I've been going on in England for some time, but we haven't heard this debate Canadians, in Canada. Canadian historiography, Canadian historians, Canadian study of the Second World War is a very primitive field still. It's not something that's popular in Canadian academe now, and, and it has not been for some substantial time. Uh, veterans tended to disappear into the woodwork after the war and and there was a sense and the veterans feel this very strongly that nobody paid any attention to them nobody wanted to talk uh, the debate went on in the UK among historians primarily for some substantial period there's been some German work as well there's a lot of American work Canadians haven't done much that's just one of the problems we have in a small country that doesn't pay much attention to the subject you talked initially about part of the, the reason, the anger that uh, this series uh, was received by some of the veterans groups was that it painted the, the, so many of the airmen and the soldiers as dupes. Yes. In all of these bombing raids, were they told, was there, quote, the deliberate attempt to hide either the casualty rate or... Uh, what their targets really were? I think, I think this was one of the worst flaws in the films, frankly. Um, they, they didn't... They knew the casualty rates. They would come back and they would find the empty beds. Uh, they knew that their, their friends were getting killed. I don't suppose many of them sat down and calculated that I would be uh, one in, in X who would survive. But uh, they certainly knew that there were heavy casualties. They suffered them. That's fair enough. But if I may... The other part of that program is basically sound, in the sense that if you look at the speeches, you look at the official pronouncements coming out of Whitehall on what the purposes of the bombing were, they never were frank and candid that the purpose of the bombing was to terrorize the German population to the point where it would, its will would be look, broken. Churchill made speeches saying precisely that. And every time Canadians, every time Bomber Command went off on a raid, they were given an aiming point. It wasn't, it wasn't the city. They were told to hit a certain specific well, spot. Agreed on that. And agreed the simple that, truth is really that for, for a long period of time, they didn't have the capacity to hit anything except a great built-up area, and sometimes not that even that. Too. Agreed on that, too. But you know, they, 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 this uh, misrepresenting, there was a tremendous amount of that misrepresenting. We, uh, th they were going after military targets. And I mean, I do think that Bomber Command, in fact, highlights one of Churchill's speeches in which really it, 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 it misleads. But I, I, it's not only the British. I mean, if you look at Truman, 
Truman, talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, still says that these are overwhelmingly military targets. Well, he knows they're not. And, and, and that is, a, and I think it's a serious question worth looking at, because the question is, why didn't we really be as, as, as explicit and as open as we should have been about the purpose which was to break terror? And the reason I think we were not, I think there was a reason, and the reason is that if we did that, then, we would, then you would focus public discussion on what, what is a surrender we want out of them. If, if the objective is to break the will, then the next question would have been, what do we want out of them? And no one wanted to discuss unconditional surrender. And because they didn't want to discuss unconditional surrender, then we didn't really fully and frankly discuss the purpose of terror bombing. I'll give you an example of this. The thing that you have to look at is on all the major belligerents had a psychological operations, psyops yep. division. Some of the best minds in Britain, Canada, and the United States were involved in psyops. They became great professors afterwards. But uh, <laughs> at what they did, I mean, if you look at what they all say to a man, practically to a man, there's something wrong with our policy, and that is we're not telling the enemy what it means to give up. Because if we told them reasonably and sensibly, we could break their will a lot sooner. The objective is to break the will, but let's, let's put some meaning behind, some words behind unconditional surrender. And the top wouldn't do it. And that's a grave responsibility, I think. The simple truth is that we bombed because they had bombed. We were, we were fundamentally retaliating for what the Germans had done. Why? Because the people wanted that. Jack. There is I'm, no doubt of that Jack, at you, all. You can get me to subscribe to an eye for an eye, but you won't get me to subscribe to five eyes for one eye. And that's what we did. Sure, it was five eyes. As we developed our capacity, as we began to recognize un that until late 1943, there was no other way of hitting back at Germany, and we used the weapons we have. In the context of the Second World War, and a historian has to go into the context of those times, no problem. you okay. use what you have. And to do anything else simply doesn't make any sense. If I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt because we will now take a brief break and we will be right back. We could now turn to uh, the Normandy uh, particular segment, and I'm, I guess, perhaps the the best place to start on that is uh, it was alleged, it was stated that uh, the men had casual and haphazard training, that uh, they went into the whole landing with very little experience, and that that was one of the uh, bunglings, if you will, of leadership even to let them go in with so little training. Well, I don't think they were lacking in training. They may have been lacking in the right kind of training, but uh, certainly the Canadian division that landed in Normandy had been trained to a fairly well. Uh, the difficulty was that they didn't have any battle experience. They were effectively green. Now, they picked up that experience and they acquired it, but they were as well trained as Canadian troops could have been at the time. The real question, of course, is that by and large, the Germans were infinitely better trained. 
they had better training systems and it worked much better. But I don't think there was a problem with lack of training. It may have been type of training. If they went over then as well trained as they could have been, uh, why the disastrous results of, of Operation Spring? Uh, or was it not as disastrous as described? It was a very serious setback. It wasn't a colossal defeat. It was a disaster for the Black Watch. It was serious casualties for other regiments. Why? Because war is a difficult, messy, nasty business. Because mistakes happen. Because commanders miscalculate. Junior commanders and generals. Because the Germans were a very effective, very skillful enemy who were very experienced and who knew how to fight exceedingly well. That's why. So there Things was... Happen. Uh, I agree with all of Jack has said, but I, I would tend to focus a bit and, and say that the program really wasn't far off when it said there's a very serious problem of generalship. And it's a concept behind this battle that really is a subject of great debate. What really was intended to be done? And very rich. And that's a great controversy. And I, I'm very fortunate. I mean, I've got a, a doctoral student, uh, Dave O'Keefe, who's been collecting material and has got the makings, really, of a great book on this subject. And uh, watching him work, what he really has tried to, to tackle is what was Simmons' conception behind this battle. And what he finds really is there's a huge amount of evidence which really points that Simmons was really following Monty's views. And Monty's views were that a great battle of attrition that finally cracked the other side. He, I mean, Monty believed in, in two fighters going at it, slugging at each other until they were so dead tired that just one last small blow even might knock them over and put them on the canvas. But what happened would be in a matter like of hours sometimes, not days. I mean, sure. battles would be hours, as you say, the, the Black Watch. Was that a matter of the, the errors being on the ground, or as the program said, with some of the leadership? It's, it's both. I have no doubt that the Black Watch shouldn't have gone up that hill. I have no doubt that the leaders shouldn't have issued the general orders they did. But that happens. War is a confusing, confused business. Simmons was a hard driver. He was a man who pushed his commanders, and you either did what he wanted and did it well, or else you were replaced. He was bloody-minded. He was a son of a bitch, without any question. He was cold and ruthless and nasty. He was also the only Canadian general for whom the British or the Americans had the slightest regard, because he was like the best of the British and the Americans. He was our most successful general. At this stage, he was still learning, I suspect, how to run a corps. He had run a division very successfully in Sicily and in Italy. Now he was running something larger. He was probably learning how to do it. But having said all of that, which you are absolutely right on, Jack, the fact of the matter is that Simmons later tried to excuse everything, saying, oh, I didn't tell him to go ahead. I didn't force him to go ahead. In fact, I told him he shouldn't go ahead till the, till the tanks were there, till the towns were secured. And, and that is a story which really deprived Phil Griffin of his Victoria Cross, in my view. I mean, those, that story that Simmons said that he wasn't pushing, that he was doing the opposite of pushing, then may, put all the blame on Griffin. Why the heck did, if his senior commander told him not to push, why did he charge up against, uh, in daylight against an open, an, a, an open field against a, a well-entrenched enemy? And the indictment of Griffin is tremendous, if you believe Simmons. But what Simmons says was against all that we know of Simmons at that time. And, and that is really, I, here's a case where I, I think the McKennas didn't exploit the material in the way you could have. Because the real story is actually darker than it's in that, that, that film. The real story is that's, that a, a relatively junior officer was made to carry the blame that really belongs higher. Blame. And a, a heroic officer who led his men, whose men were willing to follow him into death, and, he, and it was said that he was told not to go up there. The That's terrible. The blame always lies higher. It's the commander who draws the plans. Ultimately, he yeah, carries yeah, the can. Yeah. I don't have any problem with that at all. I'm not as convinced as you are that Major Griffin was quite as uh, sensible as he should have been in doing that particular uh, attack. What about on the treatment of prisoners of war? Uh, there has been a lot of focus on this uh, in various of certainly uh, the material we've been receiving in, uh, uh, six years ago. I'm wondering, was there 
any uh, recognition that there was some official policy? Are we talking about problems on the Canadian side by a few individuals? What do we know? I have seen in a lot of research one record of an order by General McNaughton in 1940 that no prisoners would be taken. Uh, we didn't, in fact, get into action and take prisoners. The order wasn't carried out. I have never seen anything else as an official policy. Uh, there is no doubt that Canadian soldiers killed captured German POWs. Most often, this was done in the heat of battle. Uh, someone's been shooting at you, you capture him, he killed your friend, bang. Uh, I can understand that. It's not proper, but I can understand where that comes from. There is, however, a very substantial difference between a German regimental commander, not a divisional commander, as Kurt Meyer is said to be in the film, but a regimental commander, giving orders, as I believe he did, to his men to kill prisoners. Put it in the larger context, and this is what the larger context is. More allied prisoners of war, a higher percentage of allied prisoners of war, return from German camps alive than did Germans return from our camps. We're not that gets talking, to the question no, of doesn't. respect of no, the Geneva Convention. We're not, it, it's, that's just nonsense. We're not talking about <laughs> treatment. Second, We're not talking about treatment in the camps. We're talking about treatments in the battlefield. And when there's a substantial difference, in my view, between individual acts of violence against prisoners that take place in the heat of the moment and deliberate killing of prisoners once they are couple hundred meters away from the battlefield. Well, the instance, and that's what the journal uh, In the instance I, 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 that we saw, that. Uh, that was the instance we didn't see that was discussed in, in the program, uh, was a description of these men being made to swim across this, uh, this small river and uh, was not uh, unknown. Do you believe this happened? Is that I, that's I more no than idea. one guy just... Uh, I have no idea if it happened. The way it's presented in the film, it might have happened. Dextras admits some responsibility for that. Dextras wasn't, of course, there. Dextras sent an officer back with the prisoners. Uh, it appears that a fewer number arrived. God knows what happened. It is entirely possible that an officer acted improperly. But if you're did, willing did to Dextras order that? If you're willing to grant that, then you probably have to grant it to Meyer, too that some of his subordinates may have been carried away and done things which he hadn't expected. There is a say. difference. There is a difference, which is that that was I think Myers was headquarters. Myers was on the ground. He was there. He would have, as a minimum, have heard the shooting. Any sensible officer would have said, what's that going on? Fair enough. He doesn't yeah, do agree. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no I doubt that Kurt Meyer was guilty. Quite often when people are talking about some of the the casualties the uh, unsuccessful if you will uh, missions they'll say well war as you did initially war can be problematic it is chaotic etc cetera, etc cetera. does that mean that there's never a point you can say look the leadership really failed uh, is there any sense that you feel that the military leadership in the normandy early days of normandy failed did not plan, did not listen to intelligence, did not understand the terrain as much as they should Look, have. it seems to be very important for Canadians to understand that they got the leaders they deserved. And that isn't a compliment. Uh, mm -hmm. The simple truth is that we had a professional army before the war of 4,000 men and about 500 officers. Uh, it was tiny, it was ill-equipped, it was ill-trained. Uh, it was a wonder that it did as well as it did. I have, yeah. in fact, described this as a miracle, yeah. and it literally was. But we weren't a great army with everybody carrying a field marshal's baton in his pack. It just wasn't that way at all. We had people who were, by and large, too old, who were, by and large, sometimes not very bright, who did the best they could with what they were given. And that we did as well as we did in Normandy and in Italy and in the rest of the Northwest Europe campaign was a tribute to the way people rose above their limitations. Absolutely. But if you wanted better generals in World War II, the Canadian people should have paid for them in the 1920s and 30s. You have to be willing to contemplate military service, to let young people go in there, to support them, to support military education. And we've cut, we're, we're about to get another crop, I think, of, of, of 
potential losers because what we've done to the military forces is we've amputated all their all their needs and then we sometime later if we get in trouble we're going to expect them to be brilliant and you can't have it both ways i mean jack is absolutely right on that if you look at those interwar policies the way we starved those military didn't give them what they needed to train or to develop or or or, or, or recruit even then you you get the generals that you that you paid for in peace thank you both and we'll be right back after taking another short break. I'd like now, obviously, to turn to the, the first, which is our third of uh, the shows on, on Hong Kong. And I think that everyone has been making the point again and again that the Canadians were sent over because it was understood that they would only be doing garrison duties so they weren't uh, trained in the way they would have been otherwise. But I'm wondering, what should not only the Canadians have known, but the British have known about the situation that uh, these, these men were being sent into. Should they have been on alert that this could quickly escalate into a, a very dangerous situation? Probably. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, British chiefs of staff assessments had looked at Hong Kong, declared it indefensible. They should have known that the Japanese, uh, given the political climate of the time, were moving towards war. But could have and should have is different than did they. And I don't think they did know definitively. And That's there was nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was some sense that uh, uh, by reinforcing Hong Kong, you might have a moral effect. The key point, I think, is that the Canadian government had no option when they were asked uh, to send troops. Had they said no, had it become known to the public that the Mackenzie King government had said no. This would have turned into an enormous political football with Mackenzie King accused of being soft on the war, soft on the British, not doing his bit. It would have been absolutely calamitous. So given that it was garrison duty, as, as they were told, the troops that were sent were garrison troops. The fact of the matter is that the Americans gave the British a magic decoding machine. They gave them, in fact, the machine that was supposed to go to Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was left without a machine. The British government, in February of 41, got the machine and was reading the traffic. And it is true that the Japanese were showing some negotiating flexibility, and you might have said, you might have said, well, there's a chance of avoiding war. Except if you knew what the British negotiating position and the American negotiating position was, you knew that there was no chance of avoiding war because you weren't going to let them. What we did in July of 41 was we organized, the British, the Dutch, Americans organized a, a total oil embargo. Japan couldn't get oil anywhere. And from that point on, uh, it, the, the Japanese said it. If we don't get this changed, it will be war. And since the Allies knew they weren't going to change it, they knew war was coming. I think the British chiefs of staff did know. And they accepted this. They accepted sending a force that was formally described as unfit for combat right into harm's way, right at the very front of harm's way. And for them, I think, the responsibility is great. Now, I justify it, and I could ex explain it a little bit in this sense, that they have so many things going. The, the way you make an indictment of the British Chiefs of Staff is to put two things very close together. They actually had a thousand things to worry about. And it may be that it just, just slipped between the cracks. They might have thought of this so separately from that, sending them to the negotiating position. They didn't put the two things together and realize that they were really putting these people in an impossible position. The, the historian, in hindsight, can see it should never have been done. 
One of the incredible reactions that we've been getting from that program is the anger felt by many of the viewers towards the, the Canadian government. Partly, I would guess, in terms of how they perceived what the government sort of allowed uh, the Canadians to get themselves into in terms of the soldiers, but also what happened afterwards. And I just want to read you, for example, two. Uh, one says, I am appalled, but not surprised at the stand our Canadian government has taken concerning the veterans, and it's referring to the Hong Kong veterans at this point. I'm ashamed we don't learn much of this history in school and feel it is unbelievable the government didn't consult the veterans when they excused Japan for their actions. The veterans deserve compensation. I'm wondering, what is the status now? And was the portrayal of the government's position with respect to the veterans, was, was that accurate? Was that uh, fairly portrayed? There's some accuracy to it. That is to say, politics prevailed over concern for the veterans in 1951, I think it was when in fact we were all anxious to welcome Japan in on our side of the Cold War and we were anxious to to not shame the Japanese and to try to rehabilitate them and so we said uh, the Canadian government said well we're gonna pull the curtain over these things and when they pull the curtain over these things who who really lost the vets I think that's certainly true and I yes the Canadian government hasn't been as good to Hong Kong veterans as it might have been as it should have been uh, our veterans legislation in general was as good as anything in the world, better than most in the world, in fact. The real fault, I think, lies with Japan. Uh, the Japanese government has consistently uh, covered up things that happened. The teaching of history in Japan consistently overlooks uh, things like the rape of Nanking, the uh, germ warfare uh, experiments with prisoners, the slaughtering of prisoners. The comfort women? The One comfort the women. There's, there's a whole series of things that the Japanese government has consistently covered up. And while the Germans, to a substantial extent, have come to terms with their atrocities, Japan never has. And I think uh, allied prisoners of war, we've just had Japan offering some money to British POWs. Um, I think the, the Japanese really have to do something to make up for what they have done to the prisoners, but also, and even more importantly, to tell their own people what but they have done. Is Amen there something that. the Canadian government ought to be pushing now for itself? Well, or does it just point to the old agreement and say, look, we've washed our hands? We probably are in a very weak legal position. The vets have tried repeatedly uh, in the UN, with Japan, and have got nowhere. The Canadian government might take a little give a little assistance to the vets as they try. They're now all very old, very ill. There aren't many of them left. It's really just a, a matter of time. It would be common courtesy. It would be good sense. It would, in fact, meet the rage that your viewers have expressed. It would be good for the Japanese. Yes. I'm wondering, now that we've seen these three programs, uh, certainly I've just been listening to the two of you have some uh, wonderful discussion of yes and no and no and yes. Uh, is there a value for these programs to be shown in schools? Is it something that, I guess, will begin to interest students in terms of their history? Certainly the responses we've been getting, uh, a lot of viewers say, why, why aren't programs like this in the schools? Because, because they shouldn't be in the schools. I think these films are so contentious and so difficult that unless they are presented by a skilled teacher who knows the context, who knows what happened, who can use them as object lessons, then I don't think they should be used. I don't think it serves education in this country when we have so little history in our schools as it is, and there's really tiny amounts, to use something that says all our leaders are fools, all of you ordinary Canadians are dupes. That really yeah. doesn't help anybody, and it doesn't represent the truth. And yet that doesn't seem to be the message in terms of the ordinary Canadians being dupes. That doesn't seem to be the message that most viewers are getting. They're talking about, I never understood how brave, how courageous, what a kind of a service uh, they gave for the country. The dupes part doesn't seem to what be what? What, how people what perceive worries it. me more, Am I though, the only one who sees that? What worries me more, though, is 
that strong emotional use, the use of emotion for argument. It is, it, that, it's all that dramatization which really, it seems to me, harms the utility of this thing in schools. Because how does a teacher undo, it, it, if it has to be undone here or there, how do you undo that very powerful, graphic, dramatic, the, the sense of being a prisoner in this thing? And that's really what worries me as a, as a teaching device. I never want to drown my students in my views so they can't think anything else. Is, if you do that, you're wrong. Is there value in this series, though, of, of history in terms of, let's say, sparking the kinds of debates that uh, have been taking place elsewhere? Is there any value? I think I know your answer, well, Jack. Well, yes, there is value. Yeah. There's value if it's done properly. The difficulty is that most teachers aren't prepared. They haven't learned enough about the war to be able to do it properly. There's danger if it's all by itself. You need Jack to come into the That's classroom. That's what you need. <laughs> well, thank you, Jack, for being with us today, and Brian. Uh, I certainly have been uh, a student who has been getting a lot of information. I'm sure the viewers are the same way and points of view, and I thank you both for being, uh, being with us today. Great and pleasure. we will be right back in a moment. Our thanks to all of you who took the time to respond to our broadcast of this series. It was terrific hearing from you. Interesting, educational, and moving. If you would like to continue the discussion, be sure and visit the websites listed below. If you're interested in seeing other programming that tackles some of the issues raised by this series, be sure and watch The World at War tomorrow. Just as the valor and the horror did today, Tomorrow's World at War episode focuses on Bomber Command. Also, join me again Wednesday when I present the classic film, Dam Busters. Until then, I'm Ann Medina for History Television. Thanks for watching.